Let us address a few homework assignment questions. So first question is, what is the major difference between an EFF and an EFF op? And uh, to answer this, we should uh, direct our attention to the file homework 7 minus util.racket. And you can see the difference yourselves. Um, so the EFF is basically a data structure that we use to return uh, the state and the result. Whereas an EFF op is just um, a struct that wraps the lambda of an effectful operation. So we're going, we're using that just to signify that that is a special kind of operation. It has no practical effect other than to visually show something and also to help me um, with the contracts when we define a contract can make it a bit more powerful as we can just say that it's an EFF op. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's, that's the main difference. So EFF op is, um, is a function that will return an EFF, right? Ultimately, that's it. Um, so you will have uh, examples of EFF ops are bind and pure and input and get and push and so on. Um, so another uh, question you may be wondering is how do I how do I implement these two rules? Um, so this is the the if condition. So the conditional in in racket. So first thing you should uh, if you're wondering if the term is curried or not, uh, the, the term is always curried. So what you get, so the, the, the part in the homework where, we, where you're asked to implement currying, that's um, evaluated separately from, um, or let me use another word, is graded separately from the function evaluation, uh, which always assume that all functions take exactly one argument and one parameter. Right, so function declaration is one parameter, function calls one argument. Um, so similarly for ifs, um, you have to pass one parameter at a time, and therefore you have these three, uh, three nested uh, function applications. Um, then what you should do is you should do um, first evaluate the condition, and then test, so do a pattern matching on its result. If the result is false, you should do what is on the right hand side. If the result is not false, then you should evaluate ET rather than EF. Right? So where ET is the, the first element and EF is the second element. That is it. That's that's regarding homework seven. And then if you're if you would like more examples of um, pattern matching. Uh, I give you a few examples. So some people asked, uh, we're having problems with how do I pattern match uh, with a value? Well, you can't because the value is not a struct. At least you can't with the usual syntax. But you can use either of these two. So you can do open parenthesis question mark and then use uh, S value and X and that will work. Or you can do X and then when. You can use the when guard. Uh, and and then call s value. So those those are two ways that you can use to represent value. Another thing that you can do uh, in pattern matching is that you can have nested uh, definitions. So for instance, here what we're saying is that we have a lambda, and inside that lambda we have a list that contains only exactly one thing, and that thing is a variable. So in this case, I used underscore because I don't care, but you could r have written X, right? Uh, and the body is here, right? So another for another example, and so you may, may be useful for homework seven, is in this case, you have a closure where you have some environment, and then inside of that closure, you have an, a lambda with a list, with a single variable, and then you have a value, right? Um, similarly, you can define uh, pattern matching to write nested function applications. I wonder where that is useful. Okay. Um, so if you're wondering, for instance, what, uh, how does the, how to read the, the lamb, the function declaration, um, translation rule that's regarding homework eight. Uh, the idea is, um, in this part of the code, what you're doing is you should be constructing a Lambda 
uh, and in the parameters list, so you have uh, in your input a list of variables. Uh, you need to convert each variable from J to uh, to from this language, from the source language to the target language. I forget what is the prefix. Uh, you need to add a new variable called this, and you need to put it inside um, a lambda. So I guess it's S colon lambda, or is it J? J colon lambda. I think it's J colon lambda. Colon lambda. And then the body of the lambda is translating E, which is here. Okay. Um, and that is it. It's, there is nothing much to it. So I guess the key points here is just uh, make sure you translate the variables from one to the next uh, and add the variable this. Uh, so in homework eight, if you look at this example and you're looking at the example and not the formalism, you will see that there's a J set. And what I was trying to say in the previous lesson was that the J set is just used for this so that it fits the screen. What you should be looking at is the yellow part. So ignore everything else. And the yellow part is the code that you're generating. Um, so this is just short name for setting a field, which is uh, used here. Okay. So this is not generated code. This is just a short shortcut of what is being generated. So you can ignore it. Uh, another question you may be wondering is what is the difference between dollar proto and prototype? And this I talked about Lex lecture, but I think it deserves a bit more emphasis. So dollar sign proto is uh, lambda js uh, representation of underscore underscore proto of JavaScript. So in JavaScript is underscore underscore proto, and in lambda js they use dollar sign proto for some reason. Okay, so whenever you see proto, um, or you see dollar sign proto, you sh they sh they are basically the same thing. Prototype is is that special field in a function that is used as the default uh, template. Okay, so it's so whenever you create an instance of A, its proto is going to be whatever is pointed to by dot prototype. Okay, so that you can define the prototype of the instances automatically without manipulating the underscore underscore proto directly. That's the objective. Okay, um, that's about it.